So we're going to first start off with our Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Ebenezer Hill, will you please do that for us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, senior board member. Uh, we now need to do the adoption of the agenda, so I'd like to see a motion to either adopt or amend the agenda as it is listed. I move to accept the agenda as listed. Second. All right, it's been first and seconded. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, all in approval of adoption of our agenda, please raise your hand. Is everyone here? All right, thank you. All right, the rest of our evening, we're going to start off with awards and recognitions, and to do that, I will turn it over to Dr. Battle. All right, thank you, Chair Elrod and board members. Um, we've actually got a lot of great accomplishments by our students and staff to celebrate tonight. Um, first, I would like to recognize our budget staff who recently received the Meritorious Budget Award from the Association of School Business Officials International. This honor recognizes our team's excellence in the preparation and presentation of the MPS budget for the current fiscal year. As everyone knows, our budget takes a great deal of time, care, patience, and diligence to put together. It's a statement of our priorities in the larger sense, but it's also a collection of thousands upon thousands of numbers and line items and details. It's a document that guides our work and makes a difference in the lives of more than 80,000 students and more than 10,000 employees and hundreds of community partners. The Meritorious Budget Award is a testament to the careful approach to budgeting and the sound fiscal management that our team, led by Chief Financial Officer Chris Henson and Director of Budgeting and Financial Reporting Barry Booker. This brings to its work, they bring this to their work every single day. Chief Henson and D Director Booker are here with us tonight, along with several other key members of the team, of the budget team. Accountants Jim Bowers, Kevin Knapp and Valerie Harbin, and Accounting Tech Holly Nelson. And Accountant Scott Stapleton wanted to be here but is under the weather. We thank all of you and everyone else who works on the budget for the tireless work you do year after year. Y'all, please come on up so we can recognize you and take a picture with you. Congratulations. So next, we have two excellent teachers who will be going away next semester, but that's not a bad thing because they'll come back to us with even more to offer. These teachers have won the prestigious Fulbright Distinguished Award in Teaching from the U.S. State Department and the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, which funds overseas travel and research. First is Meredith McGinnis, a social studies teacher at John Overton High School. Meredith will soon be traveling to Greece to study how Greek schools prepare students for college and other post-secondary opportunities. Meredith is a leader of the college and career team at the Cambridge International Diploma Program at Overton and teaches ACE Global Perspectives and AVID One, another key component of our work to help prepare students for post-secondary opportunities. She was Overton's Teacher of the Year last year and is a National Board Certified Teacher and a Blue Ribbon Teacher and I'm proud to say that I had the pleasure of working alongside her at Antioch High School. And now she's at my alma mater. Next up, oh, come on up, Meredith. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> a 
And again, Meredith, we're so proud. Thank you for representing us so well. We'd love to take a picture with you and wish you safe travels, and we look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you back in Metro National Public Schools. I also want to take a minute to recognize um, our other Fulbright Distinguished Award in Teaching um, representative. That is Ashley Haley. Um, she is an English learner's coach at Wright Middle School. Ashley will be traveling to Columbia to study the strategies that educators use to teach English to their students in bilingual schools, and she hopes to use what she learns to influence state policy. Ashley has also worked for MPS at Big Picture High School, Neely's Bend Middle School, and Antioch Middle. And she earned her education specialist degree in school leadership from Lipscomb University earlier this school year. Um, unfortunately, Ashley could not be with us um, tonight, um, but we wish her the best and um, congratulate her on this recent achievement. <laughs> So this year, we had two teams, not just one, but two, who made it to the TSSAA Football State Championship Games. Let's give it up for East Nashville and Pearl Cone High School. Now, for the record, having two teams in the finals is a historic accomplishment for MNPS, and it's one we can all be extremely proud of. Under the leadership of Coach Jamal Stewart, East rolled through the playoffs, including a 41-15 semifinal win over Comfort Covington to go all the way to the Class 3A championship game. And Pearl Cone, led by Coach Tony Brunetti, marched to the Class 4A championship game, including a thrilling 53-47 semifinal win over Haywood. Both of these teams gave it their all. They sacrificed, they worked, and played hard, and they played the right way all season long. They represented their schools, this district, and the city with skill, grit, and class. So we thank and congratulate Coach Stewart, Coach Bernetti, and all of their student athletes, all the coaches and teachers and principals and parents, and everyone else who played a part in the success of East and Pearl Cone this season. We are so proud of everyone in both of these programs. Let's give them a round of applause. We're going to have Coach Stewart and Coach Bernetti to come up along with your players and staff and principals who've joined you to take some pictures. We're going to, get, we're going to do East first and then um, Pearl Cone. So let's welcome up East Nashville. Staff, Principal Myra Taylor, and the team who represented so well. Awesome. Hey, y'all. Thanks for being here. Well yeah. done. Congratulations. Well done. Your state championship runner-ups. Way to well go. Done. Lift you up. It'll take many of us to do that. No, no, we're doing a selfie. That's my cousin. I just want to make sure I didn't photobomb you. No. Well, <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank
Again, way to go, East Nashville. Up next, we have the Pearl Cone High School, led by Coach Bernetti, Principal Miriam Harrington, and the team. give a just a personal shout out to Pearl Cone who came down a day early to cheer on East Nashville in their championship game. from Cane Ridge High School. Now let me tell you a little bit about the Hume Award before I talk about most. The Hume Award is the highest honor an MPS football player can receive. It was established in 1944 by William Hume, the chair of the Nashville City Board of Education, who wanted to ensure that football players were recognized for their achievements off the field as well as their athleticism on the field. This is an award that recognizes scholarship, sportsmanship, and character along with athletic accomplishments. Mose, a wide receiver and defensive back, has all of that going for him. He has, y'all listen closely, a 3.8 unweighted GPA, a 4.1 weighted GPA, while taking honors courses at Cane Ridge. He's considering a major in economics or city planning and plans to graduate this month and start college early. Okay. Most played in all 13 games this season as the Ravens rolled to the Class 6A quarterfinals and he finished with 37 catches for 695 yards and 12 touchdowns to go with 57 tackles and three interceptions, one of which he returned for a touchdown. All right. Oh. Forced one fumble and recovered another. Along with Caden Ridge coach Eddie Woods, I want to acknowledge Moses' parents, Brandy Phillips, and Moses Phillips Jr., who is a member of the MMPS Sports Hall of Fame himself. Woo! If you've been around, you know the genes and the family. And everyone else, uh, we appreciate everyone else who has played a part um, in his life so far. So thank you, Moses, for representing Metro Nashville Public Schools with such strength, character, and dignity. Congratulations on winning the Hume Award, and we cannot wait to see what what you do next. So I would like to... his grandmother um, up with them, Principal Sanchez, um, anyone else who is here to support him, because we would love to take a picture. Mose, do you know where you're going yet? Have you decided? I know you were waiting on some information last week. Not yet. Okay. We won't, we won't, we won't spoil it. We won't spoil the announcement. Um, but congratulations to you. Um, we, you waiting on me to come take the picture. <laughs> Ravens jersey today. That's right. Miss <laughs> Sanchez. Tell her to put her coat down. Sanchez, put your coat down, please. We can help you. <laughs> please look good. There you go. Let's give this young man a hug.
looks heavy. Before. I know. <laughs> All right, Chair Elrod, Elrod, that will conclude our um, celebrations and our awards and recognitions for this evening. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. We really love celebrating our students and, of course, our staff that pour into them. So that is such a joyful time. Uh, and it's really nice for all those families being here. So I appreciate those of you that were able to come and stay um, and be witness to that. So thank you. Uh, coming up next is our director's report. So I will turn it back over to Dr. Battle. Thank you, Chair Arrod. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome up Dr. Tina Stinson. Um, Dr. Stinson serves as our Executive Director of Research Assessment and Evaluation. Um, she's coming up to give a brief overview of how our Research Assessment and Evaluation Team, or Department RAE, if you hear that reference, um, is thinking and planning for an agenda that will allow us to leverage our resources and talents along with those of our external partners to study and evaluate our strategic initiatives to ensure they are meeting the needs of our students and staff and that we're seeing the return on investment we're hoping for to move us into being the premier large school district in Tennessee and beyond. This presentation will showcase the general format for how the RAE team is developing the research and evaluation agenda, but these are samples and do not necessarily reflect what is going to be on the agenda. I repeat, these are samples, and this is about the how our RAE team addresses our evaluation agenda um, and how we're approaching um, that and not about the what tonight. Um, this is specifically um, on our agenda as we're moving throughout the rest of the school year and into future years. Um, you will see that there is great thoughtfulness and expertise that goes into um, the approach for planning for an evaluation agenda. And so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stinson, again, who will talk about the how uh, we approach this and not the what that will be coming um, in the future. Thank you, Dr. S Dr. Stinson. Thank you, Dr. Battle, Chair Elrod. Um, what way to follow football uh, than with results-focused innovation? Um, I really can't follow those the young man and all of those football players, but I'm going to try. Um, as always, we start our presentations by focusing in on our signature initiatives and which ones we are addressing today. Um, and this one is around re uh, results-focused innovation, but it's um, results-focused innovation that centers on, you know, all of our core tenants and focused outcomes. The presentation objectives, again, um, Dr. Battle stressed brief, and I hope to be brief, um, but uh, there's three major areas. Uh, one is how research and evaluation projects inform the district's major work and key strategies. The driving questions that, that are gu guiding our team in research assessment and evaluation to develop the MNPS research and evaluation agenda and what processes are in place for advancing the RAE agenda. Um, I wanna stress that we're very excited that because though our team has been doing a lot of this work implicitly, we are for really the first time able to make it very explicit um, and you will be hearing more about it um, as we get results. So, Sorry. This. Okay. Um, before we get into the meat of it, um, we wanted to talk about our focused outcomes. Those focused outcomes are, of course, the ideal state we see for our district achieving. We might do analyses focused on our current state, um, recognizing that there are occasional gaps between the ideal and where we currently are. As Dr. Battle always says, we gotta know where we are and not stay there. Um, so that's how we develop, or not develop, how we identify problems of practice or issues we need to solve, things we need to address as a district. We're gonna focus on what we do once we get to one of those problems of practice. And I should not use this. Um, okay, usually it uh, just clicks. Um, 
Yeah, I'll just use the space bar. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, talk about the driving research and evaluation questions. Um, when we look at beginning research projects or evaluations um, by ourselves or with uh, one of our various partners, we plan to stru uh, structure the projects around six categories um, of questions. The first two are what the current state of the problem or issue is. Um, the second is what are the root causes of the problem? This is something where RAE can lean in and help other departments or other departments may already have this developed. Then we look at what are the best practices to address the problem. So this might be discovery type research. How can and how can we design evidence-based strategies um, to improve our outcomes? What are we doing across the district to solve the problem already? And which things are people identifying are working already um, for us? Um, how much are we investing in them? Is there an investment we need to pick up on because it shows promising results? And then finally, we start getting to our focused outcomes. This is actually an oversimplification, even though it looks complicated. But um, you know, then we can start looking at are our current strategies paying the dividends we want? What's the return on investment? How could the strategies be improved and in what ways? All of these are done. Um, we also focus on context, conditions, and systems um, because if these aren't in place, um, the strategies may or may not work. So we study context, conditions, and systems, for example, school climate, um, as well as the um, focused outcomes um, in, in tandem. We also want to approach all of these through the lens of um, equity and inclusion. Uh, so are our current strategies improving outcomes also includes for whom, you know, and in what context, and for whom is it working less well, and do we need to pick up um, the slack? Um, and, you know, for whom could the current strategies be improved? Um, or picked up and run with more. Um, so uh, and this goes with the context conditions, you know, the factors that are preventing students from achieving the focused outcomes. So these are the four broad areas on the research and evaluation agenda. They probably look very familiar to you as our focused outcomes. and. Um, each, of course, includes more than one um, area where we could focus. For example, transitions has elementary, middle, and high. SEL has um, attendance, discipline, um, literacy, multiple tiers that we're looking at. Um, and you know, we also have the, the climate, the equity roadmap, roadmap, and so on that we would be looking at in combination with these areas. This is a sample, as you see, splashed across the screen or is an example of some of the driving questions specific to the numeracy area. Um, and, you know, so you see the driving questions on the left, and then you see a light bulb if um, a study is in the planning phases and a check mark if one is already taking place. I mean, we have um, ideas for studies all day, every day, but there's a limited number we, we, can, we can do in um, our very geeky department. Um, and then you can see that some of these studies are internal. Um, that means uh, my, my team, which is, depends on how you count people, but a small team, but with um, expertise in research, in qualitative methods, in quantitative methods. Uh, also, we're dealing with uh, the external researchers who have to go through a process um, to get approved, and we have that all on our website. Um, so we, we do more than just this, but, um, and then we have external evaluators or um, researchers we partner with, um, both that come to us and those we go to to get expertise. Um, some of the reasons why we might choose to work internally or externally 
depend on the scope of the work, right? If we need an army of 20 graduate students in doing focus groups with teachers and with students, we are going to try to reach out to a university. We may not have that capacity. Um, or we, um, you know, we may have a literature review that somebody on our staff is very passionate about and choose to do it internally. And there may be a turnaround time of two days, you know, when we really need to do something. Uh, during COVID, we had to push out surveys very quickly um, and figure out even something as simple as what students need uh, in terms of food uh, ended up coming uh, through us in part as well as IT. So the time sensitivity of the deliverables, sometimes we're more able, sometimes we're uh, better able to partner with um, our external friends. Sometimes we also need to separate ourselves from the work. Um, we are all passionate advocates of public education and maybe believers in, in certain things that are happening, and we don't want to let our own biases blind us, and we want an external partner who can look more objectively. We're parents, you know, we're employees. Uh, and there are times when you know this is time for me to, to say you, you need to do this. Um, and uh, it's never intentional. And researchers and evaluation staff always try to separate themselves from their biases. But that's not always, you know, that's always a goal that you can never fully reach. You know, um, we all have our lenses. So we might. Um, reach out in in that sense. Um, again, we have an external um, evaluation cadre of people that we work with, both approved through an RFP process and also um, researchers we've worked with for many years and new researchers who come to us because they're interested in the work. Um, so I'm going to use that. Now that I've um, talked a little bit about um, the external versus the internal, same slide, except the kinds of methods we use. I mentioned our uh, small but mighty staff. Uh, we are all trained in surveys, interviews, focus groups, uh, document review. Um, we also have experience in quantitative methods. Uh, we might use descriptive statistics, and that's what you usually see me up here talking about. <clears throat> So how many, excuse me, <clears throat> how many students met or exceeded um, standards? Uh, that's a very descriptive st statistics. We get into inferential statistics, which are just what they sound like, trying to get at the causal relationships. Did this program have this impact? How did these two programs work together to achieve that impact? Can we unpack that? Or even something as simple as, are these two things correlated? Because if they're not correlated, they don't move together, we know there's not going to be an impact, right? So we, we sometimes fall back on strong correlational. We use a multitude of methods, um, ANOVAs, ANCOVAs, regression, um, and, and so on. And again, we reach out to our partners um, who have even more expertise in various areas than we do. We do literature reviews and root, root cause analyses and whatever else we are asked to do. Um, so um, here again, sample logic model for a project. We chose this one. Um, because it's one that may be coming up in the future. It's a very simplified logic model. So it is, um, this is a great time for my allergies to be acting up. But this is a simplified um, logic model for a project on new math curriculum adoption, which obviously has not happened yet. Um, but if we were to, to undertake an analysis of this, this is the kind of thing we would either look for the math team to have or help them develop. Um, what are the inputs? These are simply our investments, not, not just monetary, but staff time, the research we've put in on the front end, the partners we have, the volunteers we have. 
Um, then what are we doing with those inputs? What activities are we undertaking? Are we, we're developing materials, we're aligning them to standards, we're creating maps, um, curriculum maps, all of those things we're doing. Then we reach this kind of intermediate state where we don't necessarily know does this impact math scores, but we can know, like, did people attend the training? How many? For how long? What was the feedback on the training? Um, so on and so forth. Are they then taking the training and implementing it in the classroom? Again, this is an output, not an outcome. It's something that's necessary for the outcome to happen. Um, the number of students reached with materials, same kind of thing then we might start seeing short-term outcomes, such as student engagement increasing, teachers reporting that they're satisfied, um, you know, even, you know, uh, sometimes you have to monitor fidelity a little more here, right? Like <coughs> that the, you know, a short-term outcome can be 98% of teachers are implementing with fidelity. Then we start to get into the long-term outcomes um, that uh, you know everything up to this point is aimed towards um, that we achieve, for example, our focused um, outcome for numeracy. So evaluation and research can really plug in at any one of these phases, um, and they are much more than this end out outcome, um, which gets to my last point. Um, so this is, again, a hypothetical. Um, and I just did it again. Um, I'm going to go to next. Next. So um, after this brief presentation, um, there are some ways you can support us. Uh, Dr. Battle and um, the chiefs are very interested in funding research-based initiatives, right? It's at the core, it's at the core of everything we're, we're trying to do. Um, so please help us continue to advocate for these as, as we run out of ESSER funds, for example. Speak to your constituents about results as they are released um, and engage with the results themselves. And then also partner with us to convey that research and evaluation are about more than just test scores. And what I mean by that is that there are other outcomes such as a great school climate that we want to um, talk about, but also that we can plug into process improvement. You know, we can plug into all kinds of um, areas, root cause analyses and things like that, that if we, if we spend the time to really understand our issues, our outcomes will automatically improve because we'll choose the right things to do. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Battle. Thank you so much, Dr. Simpson and team. They do incredible work um, in and across um, the di district and outside of our district as well with our external partners. So I appreciate you all responding um, to the call. Um, every time a question is asked about what's working and we're already in those research-based um, strategies that we want to continue to deploy across our district. So thank you so much. Um, with that, um, Chair Arada, we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. All right, do we have any questions or discussion? This uh, I have a question. Um, when the, when you take a project uh, and pass it to external review, um, is any of our projects or, or any of external product are like peer reviewed to make sure? Like, is there such thing? I have rephrase that. Is there such thing as an external audit, like data audit, to say like our practices are academically sound, like as a validation that we are doing unbiased? research and outcome, anything like that. Is there anything equivalent to that on the data side like you would do on the financial side? Does that make sense? That question? Okay. Um, so... Is that too academic? I, well, and I think, and, and I might be going a different direction than, than your question, so pull me back. Sure. Um, because Tina, and I'll probably have you describe this, you talk all the time about when we are partnering with someone externally or there's a request that comes in, like there's lots of fidelity checks, like to make sure that it's the right data. I mean, they literally touch student information <laughs> every time we, we have a request. So if 
could just talk about the, the kind of the integrity around the numbers, the data that we do um, share if there is an agreement or that you're um, digging into giving an evaluation topic to make sure that when it comes to any bias or um, subjectivity that we're, we're at least working with the right information. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and hopefully not for too long because this is one of the major things I spend time on. So um, to start with the external research and evaluations, those we commission, um, for example, we have an initiative we want to ask somebody to evaluate. Our team is always the one that gives them all the data. Um, so. It is not the case that anybody is supervising us in doing that, but we are working in tandem with the researcher or the evaluator to do checks at all times. Anything from a simple frequency, like you, you can run a frequency table and say, I know that you know 50% of our students are not exhibiting this characteristic. Something is wrong with your underlying analysis. Um, and they do that with us about the data we give them, and we do that with them about the results they give us. Um, another thing we, we do, um, we're doing it right now, in fact, uh, I have two people checking each other's work um, about um, some data that we're giving to external researchers. Uh, they happen to be newer people in our team, and so we, we just want to be sure we're giving them the right data. It's pretty frequent that external researchers publish in peer-reviewed journals. Um, we try, for better or worse, just not to identify ourselves. That's typical district practice. Sometimes it's impossible not to. Um, so that kind of checking is happening all the time. Our data are extraordinarily complex um, and hard to work with. So we, we do spend a lot of time trying to understand them. Uh, we recently instituted, so we also have, um, let me talk again about external researchers that we have not reached out to, um, and those are, Anything from dissertators at any of our local or even national universities, online universities. Um, so we review anywhere from eight to 20 proposals a month, except during testing time, because we can't. We are literally in genes taking back testing materials at that time. And we also don't want researchers asking teachers and students during testing to participate in their research. So there's two reasons for that. We have an internal, it's called the RRC, the Research Review Committee, um, that functions somewhat like an IRB, an institutional review board at a university. So, but what we do um, that is not always welcome <laughs> is we review not just, um, you know, are these data sensitive and do you have the privacy and data sharing agreements in place, but we are reviewing whether it is something that will benefit students and teachers in MNPS now, right? Um, because we find that we spend tens of thousands, if we calculated it, it would be tens of thousands of dollars of teacher time on research. So we want to be sure that the research, even if it's perfectly valid from a data sharing um, standpoint that it can at least answer the questions that the, the researcher is posing. But we even go beyond that and say, you know, this is just not a good fit for us at this time. Our, our teachers cannot manage to do this one more thing. So I hope that gets at your question. It does. Yes. It does. Thank Actually, you. it better answer my question. I gave a better answer than I was posing. Question I was posing, anyhow. Um, oh, and then with the board support, um, like in the future, if, and I miss, you probably could do, just make sure it's in a narrative so we can, because you know, my memory as I get over 40. <laughs> Especially when it comes to numbers, I don't want to, I would love to communicate the results to education leaders, to business leaders, but make sure we also have the narrative with that 
um, so we can give the correct story and information behind it so we can speak with it with eloquence. Because it's been 20 years since I had grad school statistics, and I don't remember any of it. So. <laughs> Will do. Ms. Tyler. Um, Yes, first I wanna thank you for putting this together. It was really clear and and it was very um, concise. So thank you. I know that that's difficult when you talk about research. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, and I also appreciate that um, part of the board support is to partner with you to convey that research and evaluation is about more than testing. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I just had a couple questions about that. So are we putting those other evaluation method, uh, methods through the same kind of logic model, like the, our school climate, for example, if we do a panorama survey, are we putting that through this same logic model of you know inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes? Uh, Tina, feel free to respond, and if need be, I can sure. help chime in. I'd be happy to. So um, with the uh, survey we did with the school climate survey, when we first started, we used already validated scales. Um, scales are sets of questions meant to answer the same question, essentially, in a, in a slightly different way so that you really know you're measuring X. So we started with those um, for the reason that we needed to get one out really quickly one year. I think it was 2017. Uh, there's not the same logic model. The logic model is more for evaluation. But one, some of the things we have done are uh, we do something called factor analysis, which tells us that we are measuring the thing we think we're measuring. Mm -hmm. um, so we've done that. A member of my team has done correlations, and she's in the middle of doing correlations again, on um, which of the scales or sets of questions um, are most correlated with, and again, we don't want to say causal to, but uh, things like discipline and attendance, and they are highly related. Um, so we are looking at, the, at these in the same way. We also, um, I think, I think this is the, at least the second, if not the third, director of schools since we started this climate survey, but we are trying to constantly align the survey best to district needs. For example, we, we have uh, a section on inclusive pedagogy which we did not have, was not an original starting point for the survey. Um, and we worked with our, at that time, I think they were called equity coaches, to really you know, get the questions right. We brought people together so that we could get the language right, review it for biased language, and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's, it's helpful to see how you're kind of making sure it's working. And, and um, I just, I mean, I just wanna, so then I guess the next step to that would, would be how are we making sure that we're getting the outcomes that we want from this? Like obviously, for example, going back to school climate, we want a very positive school climate that students want to come to school, they want to be there. I feel like that's something that we all can agree on. Um, so how are we using this to inform what we do there? Tina, uh, this is a very relevant conversation question um, because we've already started um, kind of digging into that given the culture and climate data um, we do have. And, and the reason we wanted to like talk about how we approach this is because it's very complex, mm -hmm. right? Um, it requires us, as you, if you even go back to slide five where we're looking at the driving research and evaluation questions and you see the little plus at the bottom of what other factors are helping or preventing students from achieving the focused outcomes, mm -hmm. like that in its Itself. Like we spend quality time talking about those other factors, pulling in those additional data points given the research topic um, at hand. And so when we're talking about that return on investment, it is, again, programs, it supports, it's teacher time, I mean, like everything you can think of. And so um, that's where you see that um, um, interconnection between um, some of the items that might fall out of um, just your typical kind of big, broad bucket topics 
else, but truly inform um, how we're able to achieve the goals that are before us. And so it is, I mean, part of, getting back to your question, part of us going through the how is to kind of laying out that type of complexity and the thoughtfulness that has to go into what is in play for us to consider the context and the conditions and the systems that we're working with. Anyone else? Oh. So um, I just uh, basically wanted to say thanks for the presentation and also um, I've, I've worked with Dr. Stenson and her team in a variety of ways, um, both when I was at the state and, and at Vanderbilt and I, Vander, I'm sorry, uh, MMPS really has one of the best, if not really, I mean, I can't think of another one. <laughs> nope, the best. Um, <laughs> research and evaluation staff in the state of Tennessee. Um, and um, Dr. Stenson does fantastic work um, and has here for a number of years. And we're very lucky to have you um, and your team. And I'm always excited to talk about any of the findings from the studies as well. Um, so just wanted to say thank you. I'm a beginning. So Mrs. Block beat me to it, but I have also known Ms. Stinson for a long time, and also as a formal doctoral student, the process is very rigorous in applying for research and research opportunities as an external um, candidate, um, and so I would say also that it's a really top program. Ms. Stinson knows a lot um, and is very valuable and is a great asset to our district, so thank you. Thank you for nerding out with us. Yes. <laughs> well, thank, you so thank you, um, Dr. Stinson, and uh, again, thank you to your team for all the work you do. Uh, one last thing, and I, I failed to um, do this at the end of our awards and recognition. I did not take a moment to acknowledge um, Mark North, who serves as one of our athletic directors working specifically with our high schools. Um, Mark, thank you for your leadership, um, the support given to all of our teams and sports and athletes this year has been tremendous um, and definitely kind of ushering us through this historic moment and having the representation we've had at the state um, level. Um, this season, last year um, as well, and for everything that's to come. So I just wanted to acknowledge you and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you for also recognizing Mr. North. Um, that brings us to our next part of the agenda, which is public participation. So public participation is where we now hear from MMPS stakeholders that signed up to speak to the board uh, for the evening. Uh, you will have three minutes. At the end of your three minutes, you will hear a bell. Sounds like that. Um, and then we ask that your uh, comments then end. We are going to have the list. Thank you for having it up on the board. We have the public participation list up on the board. We ask that you line up in numeral order. So if you're number one, you'll come up to the podium to speak. And number two and three will line up behind them. So we will not be calling names but numbers. Um, as your speaker returns to your seat, of course, you can come up as needed. Uh, you do need to tell us your name when you come up in front of us. Uh, we would like it if you could tell us what district you're in, and if you cannot, you can tell us your address, but we either is fine with us. And um, if you have any materials that you would like to share with the board, if you will leave them at the podium so they can be presented or passed out at the end of this meeting, that would be so helpful. So we will get started with number one on the list. And if number one's not here, we'll move to number two. No. How about number three? I got the same list y'all did. Oh, hi. Oh. Hi. Come on down. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Catherine Nelligan. I am an instructional leader at Purpose Prep Academy. Um, like you, part of my job is to advocate for members of my community. I'm here to advocate for the academic excellence that lives at Purpose Prep, especially given that the fact that you all were not provided with accurate or verifiable data um, in the last board meeting. Ms. Tyler, in the last board meeting, you said that charter schools exist to be better than everyone else because surrounding schools do not meet the need. We agree with the statement. Last year, an average of 27% of MMPS students scored proficient in literacy, and an average of 30% scored proficient in math. In North Nashville, where Purpose Prep resides, only 21% of students scored proficient in literacy and 16% in math. 
service prep significantly outperforms both the district and the state, proving that we provide an academic experience unlike the schools in the surrounding area. This is a fact. Last year, 58% of Purpose Prep scholars scored proficient in literacy and 47% scored proficient in math. Purpose Prep is one of the top 10 schools for academic proficiency in the district. Indeed, the goal of our original charter was to perform 15% higher than surrounding district schools, and we have. Purpose Prep outperformed the district and cluster not by just 15%, but 37% higher in literacy and 31% higher in math. So, Purpose Prep is providing an academic experience that far outpaces both the district and the state. Ms. Tyler, the next time you examine proficiency data, please be sure to look at it in context. Chair Elrod. Please keep in mind that your responses are supposed to be to the entire board, not to individual board members. Okay, great. Board, in the last meeting, you disaggregate data points to highlight disparities amongst student groups. When you disaggregate state test scores by race and economic status, the data shows that both black and economically disadvantaged students are historically underserved in MNPS. This is a fact. Purpose Prep is passionate about effectively serving marginalized students. It's something we do very, very well. So well, in fact, that Purpose Prep is the number one non-selective public school in the district to serve economically disadvantaged students in both literacy and in math. Purpose Prep is also the number one and number, one, number two elementary school for black students in both literacy and math, respectively. Next time you disaggregate data, please accurately account for economically disadvantaged and black experiences. Their proficiency levels matter. Unfortunately, the data points I just shared with you were overlooked um, and misrepresented in the last board meeting. As a board, it is important that you maintain and publicly share accurate information. In the, in the future, I encourage you to seek out and consider multiple data points. Thank you. Thank you. Number four. Shauna Russell, Director of Academics at Purpose Prep. Uh, thank you to those board members who voted us to serve families for 10 more years. I'd like to address three things. One, misconceptions on special education. Two, the impact of a no vote. And three, tacit criticism of how we empower our families. Uh, the chair of this board expressed concern that only 7% of our students have IEPs. When RTI functions as intended and as aligned to the district's MTSS framework, experts across the nation agree this is an appropriate ratio. Strong tier one and two and instruction, like we have at Purpose Prep, divert students away from Tier 3 in special education. The Association of Black Psychologists cites overrepresentation of African American children in special ed as a critical problem, and the top contributing factors is over-identification and poor Tier 1. Similar research backing IDEA amendments found that economically disadvantaged black children are 2.3 times more likely to be identified as developmentally delayed than white children. So as IDEA was intended, the percentage of students with IEPs should not represent neither bias nor the number of students with disabilities a school serves, but the percentage of students who need additional support because of a disability. Our fall MAP testing identified less than 10% of all students at Tier 3, less than 20% Tier 2, and the rest Tier 1. Students with disabilities can exist at every tier, and they do at Purpose Prep. 7% does not mean we cherry pick, it means we divert. Secondly, the no votes. I speak now to the entire board, but you know who you are. And as the charter renewal votes in general fell mostly along racial lines, I urge you to consider how we, I'm talking to you, we have been exercising school choice for centuries and where we're able to live to access good schools and how we are statistically more likely to experience upward mobility. And here in the US, we add class on top of race. Poverty is racialized here and you don't get to talk about purpose prep without acknowledging who we serve and how we have served them better than any other elementary school in the city. Third and fourth grade economically disadvantaged students in ELA of all schools, number one. Economically disadvantaged students in math of all elementary schools, number one. African American fourth graders and literacy, number one. Next time you raise your hand in the name of defending public education and opposition to school choice, ask yourself, whose public education, whose choice? Thirdly, I'm concerned that the tactics of our families and staff have used to share facts have interfered with their right to fair judgment. Knowing our disaggregated academic achievement breakdowns, how can another charter school be described as meeting the academic needs of students in a way that other charters have not? 
the MNPS Review Committee found that we met and exceeded standards for all four areas. And according to the achievement indicator on our state report card profile referenced, we exceeded said school's metric by 3.4%. And I struggle to see any difference between the population that school serves and ours, or sorry, then um, I struggle to see a difference between the two schools other than the populations we serve and how our families are being impacted and subjected to respectability politics. Our families Thank are now going to speak. Thank you for your time. Number five. Number six. My name is Lager Newman. I'm the founder and head of School of Purpose Prep. First, thank you to those board members who voted to approve Purpose Prep's charter. Your support impacts children and families throughout MMPS who deserve high-quality educational opportunity. We come here to voice our concerns regarding the misinformation that was shared by board members at the November meeting. As publicly elected officials, it's important that you are basing your decisions on factual information. Unfortunately, this was not the case. Unfortunately, Chair Elrod misrepresented our economically disadvantaged numbers stating that they were only 26%. Despite the public outcry from the audience and one brave comment from a fellow board member raising skepticism for this mistruth, she continued to reveal how disconnected she is from the community that Purpose Prep serves by claiming this number to be factual based on her data report. That data report is wrong. According to the Title I office, the office within MNPS that is designated to specifically focus on economically disadvantaged children, Purpose Prep serves a population of 70% of economically disadvantaged students. 70%. That's 44% difference from what was stated. Purpose Prep's sole existence in the city was to fill a major academic need in MNPS for the most vulnerable children in our city. Our school was intentionally created with these brilliant and capable children in mind. In Instead of joining the litany of excuses that we often hear for why children of poverty cannot learn, Purpose Prep is proving that these very children, when provided with the educational supports and high expectations that they deserve, can learn at exceptional levels. Our population of economically disadvantaged children are why Purpose Prep has been a reward school within this district on three different occasions. Notably, per the most recent TN Ready results, Purpose Prep had the highest proficiency for economically disadvantaged elementary students in the entire district for both both reading and math, for both reading and math, the highest, yes, Purpose Prep is the number one elementary school serving economically disadvantaged students in the entire district. We believe that it is unfair for you not to have accurate data for Purpose Prep and for what was stated to live as fact, especially because Purpose Prep's success is rooted in the opportunities that we are providing some of the most vulnerable children in the district. However, our community refuses to allow mistruths to unjustly overshadow the good, hard heart work full of integrity, self-determination of excellence. We will rise up with purpose every single time. As a public school advocate and someone who has worked in both district and charter schools, I encourage you all to govern all schools within this district equitably. Charter schools are public schools and our families are public school families. I understand that the board oversees the budget. We're asking you to see a bigger picture here. Nashville Adult Literacy Council has tracked that one in five Nashville adults are at the lowest level of literacy, and nationally, 43% are living in poverty. Strong literacy breaks the cycle. When you invest in schools, you are breaking the cycle. You're not losing money, you're saving it, you're investing it, you're doing your job. Thank you. Number seven. I'm representing Rhea Groves Dixon. This is my fifth year as an NMPS public ch charter school parent, and I am so blessed to have found a school that actually educates scholars while setting high expectations and promoting integrity. As a reminder, they, they are one of the school's leading NMPS. My baby boy is thriving at Purpose Prep Academy and is thusly excited about his own future. With that said, I'm curious to know why the board is scared of p charter school success. I have been to countless board meetings where we have been lied to and degraded. This, to me, is ridiculous. I want to remind you of the harm you do to innocent children when you choose to do the, the to do things like intentionally misform, misinform them and their parents, telling them they are not NMPS students. We all know, know this is a false narrative. 
after repeatedly doing this, it's probably time for you to stop taking advantage of your position and step down. You do not treat children this way. And while on that note, you, you all had a school choice fair and maliciously left out charter schools and scholars. How deceiving is this to parents and parent choice? and hurtful to these amazing babies that you have the privilege to serve. And for those of you who collude and make up stats, you might as well have pulled them from a toddler on TikTok. How dare you question the school performing highest in the district? How dare you question a 10-year charter agreement renewal and not factor all the years of a pandemic that we have all been through? Your George Mitkis experience is extremely reckless and irresponsible. I'm leaving this. Dr. Battle is the doc director of all NMPS schools. I want to remind you that your position includes education advocacy for all NMPS students. Ms. Christian Bugs, I'm a fan of God's grace and, and a fan of growth. It was you who motioned to approve our agreement renewal about two weeks ago. We are so appreciative. Thank you for stepping up for what is right for our babies. I pray that you will begin to do the same. One more thing. Go Purpose Prep. I want to remind everybody that we do not read uh, motions on behalf of other people that is within our policies and procedures. Uh, number nine. Good evening, board members. How are y'all doing? My name is Sharon Cooper. I am a mother of three children that attend this school that you all seem to think that's, you know, so damn. So I just, you know, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say that I know the politics of, of the board and all of that, but I'm going to tell you a little bit what I do now. I can tell you that all of my children well, actually, two of my children have been to Metro Nashville Public Schools, and my first child, he graduated through the skin of his teeth. But my son, my, my son that goes to Purpose Prep, he has excelled in more ways than many. My daughter is excelling. My other son is excelling. I never thought this could happen. I'm excelling through Purpose Prep because I get to learn over again. So, you know, I'm just here to just tell you guys you know, what, what, whatever, you know, whatever misinformed that you guys have been getting or whatever the, the statistics is, you know, y'all might want to take a better look at it because I feel like this, y'all having these fairs and stuff for these other schools and not these charter schools, and these charter schools is what's happening. I, I have seen more kids excel in charter school than regular MNPS, and I was an MNPS student. You know what? I did not excel with you guys. You know what I'm saying? I did not accept. I didn't have what my children have. I didn't have teachers telling, you know, coming to me, telling me that I could be somebody. You know, we live at 3151 Ewan Wood Drive. We live in the heart of the hood, and my children are excelling every day, every day at Purpose Prep. And that's all I would like to say about that. You guys have a good night. Number 10. Hello, my name is Lauren Jenkins. I am a proud fifth grade scholar at Purpose Prep Academy. Purpose Prep is very important to me because throughout my journey with Purpose Prep, it has made me very successful. I have grown so much at this school because Purpose Prep pushes me to work hard. Purpose Prep has made me love school because it's a place where I feel challenged and successful at the same time. My, friend go, my friends go to different schools, and I can tell that the education at Purpose Prep is a little more advanced than at other schools. I know scholars who have graduated from Purpose Prep and go to academically challenging schools like Meg's Middle and Head Middle. When I'm at school, I know that the education I'm getting will make me successful in middle school, high school, and beyond. Purpose Prep has taught me about showing leadership, respect, and purpose. I am a leader at school because I support others to do the right thing. For example, 
I am working with when I am working with my partner in math, I work with them step by step to help them understand. At Purpose Prep, I have learned about respect because at first I thought respect was just like holding the door for someone. But now I realize respect can be shown in other ways. For example, I have learned to pay attention when somebody is speaking. I can use what someone says later, later in life to help me accomplish my goals. Finally, I have learned about purpose. To me, purpose means doing things with a meaning. I... My purpose in life is to become a doctor. I feel like I am already on my way to becoming a doctor because of the education I receive at Purpose Prep. The education I receive at Purpose Prep has prepared me to speak to you today. When you think about Purpose Prep, please think of me and other scholars like me. Purpose Prep is one of the top schools in Metro and it is very well deserved. Thank you for your time. 11. Good evening. My name is Latasha Watkins, and I am a former and present parent of a student of students in special education at Purpose Prep Academy. My children and I reside in the North Nashville community. They have been blessed to attend a school where they can exceed, they can excel higher than students in the same grade at other schools in their zone. Thank you for those who voted to keep this blessing going. My oldest son entered Purpose Prep below grade level due to his medical diagnosis of epilepsy and autism. After being enrolled for five years, he left well above grade level. He's now in the eighth grade at East Middle, He's middle school and has enrolled in encore classes since fifth grade. My godson, who is now in kindergarten, has an IEP for developmental delay, speech, and occupational therapy. He is, he is also moving in the right direction with the help of his teachers and the strategies that are in place. I am 100% confident that my godson will be one of the students that will leave higher, on higher grade level than those in his own school, just like my son and other children. I have shared my personal experience with the special education department at Purpose Prep, so you will understand why I am a proud, long-term parent and advocate of Purpose Prep. I want you to understand that not all special needs families can feel the way that I feel, all because some people higher up decided to keep charter schools like Purpose Prep on the hush. It's not fair that the highest performing elementary school was not allowed at the choice fair. It isn't fair that you say Purpose Preps is not serving enough sped kids. Do you want us to serve more? We will. Maybe families don't know about Purpose Prep and that's because you don't want them to. Now let's reflect on some of the things that MNPS pride themselves on. You say core values. Your core values drive and focus our collective com commitments included in our mission and vision. These, prin these principles guide our intent and conduct as well as our relationship with the external community. And it goes on, but Purpose Prep goes into the community. They help their families in times of needs. They do the footwork. They also serves the lowest area and it's making a big difference. Are you? You say literacy. We believe that research shows early reading success is a critical factor in a child's likelihood of graduating from high school and experiencing future life success. The scores don't lie. I'm not sure how scores were possibly questioned two weeks ago, but that wasn't real. I'm not sure how the special ed department effective, effectiveness was questioned when the school has 10 years of compliance reports and good standing on our records. Um, Sorry, but this school is not only a school of choice. This school is a school of purpose for me. I pride myself and my kids on going there. And like it says, Purpose Prep, purpose prep Academy. And I hope it has a purpose in your heart. And I hope that you see it also. Number 12. Good evening. My name is uh, Robert Churchwell. Um, my uh, grandfather is Robert Churchwell Sr., who the school is named after over there on D.B. Todd. And my father is uh, Robert Churchwell Jr., the famous uh, band director and administrator of Metro Public Schools. I'm here to speak to uh, the needs being met of diversity students. Uh, being from the community in North Nashville, uh, there's been a rumor for years now about um, students being, needs not being met and grades could be better and 
all kinds of things like that. So during research, I was able to come up on quite a little bit of surprise of a school that's in North Nashville. And I learned that uh, a North Nashville school that has been named the first school in North Nashville to achieve reward school status for academic performance. I also learned uh, that a school in North Nashville whose test scores were so high achieving that they were named the top 5% school in the state of Tennessee for academic performance. I also learned that there's a school in North Nashville that celebrates different nationalities, HBCUs, and grounds their staff in topical readings of engagement to ensure that they are are aware of the challenges the city, the state, and the countries are facing. A need is defined as something that is essential and very important, and as a staff member of Purpose Prep Academy, I can, I can confidently say that the needs of diversity students are being met at Purpose Prep Academy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, number 13. Number 14. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, I'm coming as a parent uh, in a District 5, as you asked us to state that. Um, my wife and I, we have started uh, a decision to become uh, foster parents with the intention to adopt in 2019. Uh, in 2020, we were fortunate enough to get a young man that was coming to uh, live with us in December of 20, and he came from Williamson County Schools. Uh, he was in the second grade. Um, that spring, we enrolled him in the Purpose Prep. Of course, the pandemic was here, so um, he was doing virtual learning. Uh, while doing virtual learning, uh, we came across the fact that uh, he had trouble reading, severe trouble reading. And, uh, you know, becoming a parent for the first time, you having a kid that's in the second grade that can't read, that supposedly came from schools that taught well, you know, we were like at a crosswords, but working with the faculty and staff at Purpose Prep, uh, we came to find out that he could read with help. And with that help that Purpose Prep has extended, he loves to read now. Uh, he loves Purpose Prep. Um, I don't know what we would be without Purpose Prep. Um, we love the teachers. We love the students there. And that's just our personal story about what Purpose Prep has done for our family. And uh, we love it. And when I appreciate you all for granting the uh, extension of the charter or because that allows both of our sons to finish their career going to the fifth grade with Purpose Prep. Thank you in advance. Thank you. Number 15. Number 16. Hello, school board members. My name is Autumn Jemison, and I am a Nashville native, born and raised, lived in the same house and neighborhood all my life, South Nashville. And I graduated from Hillsborough High School in 2019, a part of the IBCP candidate program. I am now a graduating senior at Dillard University, a private HBCU in New Orleans, where I major in film and double minor in accounting and English. Having my experience in New Orleans and seeing their school system, I can confidently say we are the Athens of the South. Tennessee schools, especially MNPS schools, have definitely prepared me for my time in university. With that being said, I know I could not have excelled to the secondary part without advanced academics, which is what I'm here to address today on behalf of NOAA Advanced Academics Committee. My experience in the IBC Peak program, I was one of maybe three to five black kids in my classes, which has put me in a very awkward position socially because on one hand, I'm speaking for my culture, and on the other hand, I'm speaking for almost half of the school because our teachers were not transparent in our classes of, adver of advertising IB classes to all students. It was only advocated in honors classes. What I want today is for the Metro School Board to be more transparent with their goals in setting people of color and students of color, black students in particular, in these advanced academic, selling, academic settings so we can all thrive and rise to be as great as we want to be. Because it doesn't just stop at white students or just high school. It goes beyond that. Thank you for what, listening today. Number 17. 
Hello, my name is Tom Surface. I am a voter in District 8, was 908. I'm a proud parent of two uh, Metro Schools graduates. I'm a former algebra and geometry teacher and a member of the Nashville Organized for Action and Hope, NOAA. So as Ashford Hughes has said, and I hardly agree, it's time we move from equity talk to equity walk. So I was glad to see that the data in the open data portal was updated recently. I looked a couple weeks ago. The behavior data, uh, the data set was there. It takes us through November. Uh, and in that data, center, data set, you can see that racial disparity in discipline remains. Black students continue to be more than three times as likely to be suspended as white students. More than three times as likely. As stated in the board's new equity policy, the district must establish and make publicly available plans and procedures to implement all equity goals, and for those goals to be measurable and to have clear accountability. One of those goals is to reduce racial disparity in discipline. So what are the specific goals and outcomes you are using to measure progress towards that equity? I applaud the new peace and advocacy centers that have been implemented. How will we know if they are working? So we agree with Mr. Hughes, it's time to move from our equity talk to our equity walk. Thank you. Number 18. Good evening, board, Dr. Battle. My name is Taneka Vercher. Um, I am here with the, the NOAA Education Task Force, and I just want to talk about the importance of, of accountability. Uh, we do have the, the equity roadmap, but we do know there's inequities that remain in discipline, advanced academics, um, literacy, achievement, the school climate, and quite frankly, we know kids are showing up to school every day feeling that they are not safe. That's a fact. We need clear, measurable goals and outcomes centered around equity. Equity isn't just student-centered, but it also extends to teachers and support staff because it aids in the school climate. Children can't learn. Parents don't feel that the conditions that they're leaving their children in are safe when we don't have these type of policies and procedures in place. And we know that our black students, they remain, um, they're continuing to fall even further behind them from their peers. So I'd like to implore this board and the director a sense of urgency in establishing and making public plans for a transparent process and procedures that we go beyond just having a stated equity roadmap, but we implement equity goals with, with clear, accountable actions actions and oversight. Thank you. Thank you. Number 19. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Battle. I am Dr. Paula Pennegrass, the current Vice President of MNEA. I reside in District 2, where Rachel Ann Ayrault is my school board member. I want to read the MEA Board of Directors statement. We, the MEA Board of Directors, are grateful for the steps that have been taken over the last two years to correct the salary scales and improve pay for all staff. This has demonstrated a commitment to educators from the district and the city. While this has been a step in improving the conditions for our educators overall, we continue to hear from teachers and other school personnel who are overwhelmed by the huge responsibilities the district has piled on in a time when a staffing crisis is forcing educators to continue, continuously give up their already limited planning. Furthermore, rising health care costs have rendered the recent salary increase almost minor. We need the district to commit to retaining teachers by making making significant changes to the budget priorities and policies. We are asking the district to prioritize increasing sub-pay and adding longevity pay in the budgeting for next year. 
Additionally, we are advocating to change the transfer and renewal po policy, increase protections and equity of planning time, and cap insurance increases. Teachers need the time to do their jobs effectively. They need to feel supported and they need to see that the district values the work that they do. Without this, we fear we will see a mass ex exodus of educators. Once again, thank you, Madam Chair, school board members, Dr. Battle, for allowing me this space to be the Metro National Education Board, board of Directors statement. Thank you. Thank you. For 20. Hi, my name is Mary Jo Cram. I'm the secretary treasurer of MNEA, a teacher at the Academy at Old Cockrell, and the mother of a first grader and a fourth grader at Dan Mills Elementary. I'm here to support Emily Masters' resolution against the third grade retention law, which she's planning to bring next month. This week, I've received emails from my children's school that fill me with dismay. Our wonderful principal, Mr. Yates, informed many parents of this retention law for the first time telling us in no uncertain terms that educators and school districts across the state are firmly opposed to it. He used alarming all caps to emphasize that most students across the state test below what is considered proficient. Mr. Yates has promised communication and support to families. He's doing the best he can with an impossible situation created by our state legislature. Then I got an email from the PTO informing me that our popular after-school clubs program is being discontinued this spring so that the school can direct its resources instead to support third grade students and ensure they pass the test and move on to fourth grade. Clearly in this situation, it's best for the school to allocate its resources this way. But it is a shame that the state legislature has created a, a situation in which all students suffer from the loss of an enrichment program. I asked the teachers on the third grade team at Dan Mills for their opinions on this law. And they told me, quote, it goes against everything we are as educators. We as an educational system have placed so much effort on making sure our students' mental health is the best it can be. We focus a lot of our time on mindfulness and taking care of our needs. When we state that one test and one day can change the course of your life, what are we actually teaching them? As adults, we do not have that much pressure placed on us. We're adults and we never have to face that. How can we tell eight and nine year olds that one day will change the course of their summer or their entire next school year? This is absolutely absurd. I do not want to look at my kids in the eyes and tell them this one test is a determining factor for their next course of life. These tests should not tell a student they are a failure." End quote. Board members, please support Emily Masters' resolution against the retention law. And state legislators, I hope you're listening. Thank you. Number 21. Good evening, Chair, Dr. Battle, members of the board. Uh, my name is Graham Spencer. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Uh, and I teach in District 3 at Goodlistle Middle. I uh, just, would just like to share a few, few moments of gratitude for our MNPS board and our MNPS family. Uh, first, thank you to Dr. Battle and the team that came out to Goodlistle Middle a couple of weeks ago. Our students really took a lot of pride having the team at our school. You could really see an extra special glow in their eyes long after everyone left. Uh, I know my wife also truly appreciated having y'all spend time in her classroom. Uh, she was thrilled that y'all came to see her, and I promise she and Mr. Townley really do co-teach that way on a daily basis. Uh, it means a ton that our support team cares about coming out to our schools. Uh, second, thank you to host. Sorry, thank you for hosting our celebration of schools. I, as well as our school team, had an absolute blast. Our kids had a blast. Our cheerleaders had a great time, even though it was felt like 20 below. I uh, <laughs> think I'm finally warmed up. Uh, third, I'd also like to share the gratitude of Jaquith Smith, a gifted and talented teacher with Metro National Public Schools. Uh, she wanted to make sure that we took time to acknowledge the wonderful teamwork experienced with MMPS. Uh, she contacted our MN. Sorry, M and E A team with a question about using BEP money to purchase. Land, uh, sorry, live. We got two. Land school, live school, Nearpod. Nearpod specifically. Um, she was able to purchase it while we were virtual using BEP money when we came back in person. Uh, she was told she was not able to do that. Uh, our MNEA team told her to reach out to Dr. Mason Bellamy. Uh, Dr. Mason Bellamy got with her principal and his team and made it happen. Uh, so she's very thankful for that. I, I'm thankful for her thanks for our team making things happen. Uh, she, we also just definitely want to thank her principal, Allison McMahon. Sorry, Administrator Allison McMahon. My hand to invalidate correspondence as well. So thank you all for supporting our students. Thank you. And number 22. 
Um, good evening. My name is Halle Trager, and I'm a resident of the 6th District and a proud engineering and biostem teacher and technology student advi association advisor at ANIAC High School. I'm also chair of the MNEA Advocacy Committee, uh, which synthesized survey responses from a broad cross-section of membership um, and actually teachers across the district to develop the platform that Vice President Pendergrass described. In the survey and, these, and in these conversations, one dominant theme emerged. Teachers feel overworked and under-respected. Every day we put in um, time far beyond the school day to plan meaningful instruction and ensure students receive the education they deserve. We are deeply committed to building meaningful instructional experiences and relationships with our students and to ensuring that in practice every student is and feels known and engaged in school. But we face many demands on our time that too often feel like barriers to these core missions. We are called to cover multiple class periods per week because subs are not adequately paid. We are asked to provide mountains of often duplicate documentation of all our efforts, recording each parent contact in multiple different systems, and logging student support via sewn to grow Navigator, and school-specific platforms. Many are called into multiple meetings per week, leaving little time for planning or for providing thoughtful feedback to students. And as you have heard too many times, we are caught in a self-reinforcing cycle. Some teachers, exhausted and overwhelmed by the combination of intense demands and the message that our efforts are never enough, decide they must leave. Those of us who stay feel even greater coverage, face even greater coverage needs, greater demands on our time, and greater pressure. For this reason, our campaign this year is framed around respect and support, again. Respect for our time and professional judgment through full protection of planning time for all members. Respect for teachers' personal and professional needs and support for a fully staffed district through increased flexibility in transfer and renewal policies so that teachers who feel they need to leave one school might at least fill another vacancy within the district. And finally, respectful compensation so that our substitute teachers are paid a living wage that respects their time and skill and encourages full sub coverage. So that our most veteran teachers are financially recognized for their wisdom and their dedication to the district. And so that we do not again face a situation in which rising health care costs undercut cost of living adjustments to our pay, compounding the current affordability crisis that we all face in Nashville. Please hear that we share this board and Dr. Battle's goals for student success. We are coming to you with specific suggestions to help achieve these goals based on our experiences in classrooms every day. We ask for your support in adjusting policies to improve the sustainability of teaching in MNPS and in turn promote our ability to offer the highest quality of instruction and support for our students. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, so that ends public participation, which brings us to our consent agenda this evening. Um, we have already um, adopted the agenda as listed. Do we have a motion, or may I have a motion, excuse me, to approve the consent agenda as it is listed? Motion to approve. Second. All right. Will you please raise your hand in the affirmative if you want to approve the consent agenda as it is listed? Raise your hand to approve. That is everybody. Thank you so much. Okay, that brings us to announcements and committee reports. I know that um, our governance leader had to step out real quick, so I will give that really that um, committee meeting real quick. So we went over several policies. Those are listed within our agenda from earlier today. Um, you can see those changes as they were highlighted there. Let me make sure I list them though so it's available to everybody. So it was 2.805 for purchasing, 4.210 for credit recovery, 4.301 for interscholastic athletics, 4.700 testing programs, and then we had a discussion only on the public participation policy as it current stands. There were no changes to it, but a discussion about um, us following it starting at the beginning of this upcoming year. Outside of that, we had um, budget, and so Ms. Player, will you please give us a committee report on that? Um, yes, we went through um, kind of our um, annual protocol of amending the budget. Um, the operating budget for the current fiscal year is the same budget allocation of roughly $1.1 billion dollars um, and what we added was eight um, positions in the human resources department and it was a cost neutral of two um, ELL positions so I was going from a grant into our, our formal operating budget and we used cost savings um, to pay for all of those positions. All right. All right, let's do announcements. 
District 1, District 2, District 3. Good to you. District, District 3. three. Oh, that was That's Emily, isn't it? District yes. 4. My apologies. That would be me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Um, no announcements. Um, just wish everyone a happy holidays. Um, and I'll see you next year. Thank you. District 5. Man, life came real fast. Um, <laughs> I want to send a special thank you to Cheekwood for inviting the Robert Churchwell family out. I know they're reaching out to different school board members, so be on the lookout for a, an email from Santa London. Um, they're just trying to get students, uh, make students and families aware of the value of Cheekwood, that it's really in our own backyard. And we, my family and Robert Churchwell families really had a blast, so cannot wait to continue to work with them. Happy holidays, everyone. District 6. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I have to move my... That's okay. Go away. My apologies. I have to make a rearrangement here. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, I want to send a big shout out to uh, AP Dr. Northing Northington and Mr. Derek Leonard at H.G. Hill Middle School for welcoming me yesterday. I had an amazing time with those young people. Um, specifically, I wanted to give a special shout out to the super amazing young men that are part of the Rites of Passage group. They were very engaging and they asked a lot of great questions. Um, one young man, Justin, asked specifically for Dr. Battle to visit the school because apparently he has a thing for Dr. Battle and she's just awesome according to him. So Pretty there awesome. you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, they also asked me specifically about how they would go about coming to a school board meeting, and we talked through that, and I was really excited that they were that interested in attending a school board meeting. These are middle schoolers, so that was interesting. But I told them to let me know when they were planning to come so we could welcome them. Uh, I'm super excited about that. We'll see. Hopefully they'll do it. And finally, at H.G. Hill Middle, uh, my new friends, Timothy and Mackay, who were uh, exceptional young men. Mr. Timothy is, is now going to be known as Mr. Pizza because he was able to finagle a pizza party for his entire group from my visit yesterday. So I'm only too happy to support them in that effort. Um, but it was a really good visit, and I'm very excited uh, to, and I'm very thankful to Mr. Leonard for offering, for asking me to come to visit the school. And again, AP Northington was very, very welcoming. So thank you, HG Middle School. I appreciate it. I will come back again. Um, and also wanted to extend another congratulations to, um, I'm sorry, I've got this all written down here. Let me just go in order so I don't mess anything up. Uh, congratulations to Antioch High School's band director, Mr. Frank Zimmerer, for his nomination for the Outstanding Music Teacher Award. The Manilow Music Teacher Award recognize an announce, recognizes an outstanding music teacher who helps to bring music to life for his or her students. Manilow Music Teacher Award recipients receive $10,000, $10, a $5,000 cash prize, and a $5,000 and $5,000 Manilow bucks that can be used to purchase instruments for their classroom. The Manilow Music Teacher Award honoree will be invited to an upcoming Barry Manilow concert, which for Nashville is January 20th, and presented their award in a special backstage meet and greet. Now, this is not an automatic, so we have to vote for Mr. Zimmerer, and the top vote recipient will be selected for the Manilow Music Teacher Award. We can help spread the word and get out and vote for Mr. Zimmerer by going to manilowmusicproject.org and just click on the link and please share that with others so that we can get our fantastic music director his award. And another congratulations to Mr. Mose Phillips III on the, being the recipient of the 79th Annual Hume Award. That was awesome. He's a good kid. That was awesome. Uh, also, as a reminder, in January, the Nashville MLK Day events will be back in person. We will have a week of events that will begin January 10th and conclude on MLK Day on January 16th uh, with the annual pre-convocation rally at Jefferson Street Baptist Church 
and the March to Gentry for convocation. Our convocation uh, will begin at 10 a.m. at the Gentry Center, and this year's theme is Protecting the Dream, Confronting the Assaults. Our featured keynote speaker will be Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. For more information on all events, please visit our website at mlkdaynashville.com. Uh, additionally, we will also have performances by several uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools uh, students. Uh, Pearl Cones, we will have uh, several of Pearl Cone High School students performing, as well as students from District 6, I believe AZ Kelly. So if you are available, please join us January 16th, but check the website because, again, we will have events that will lead up to MLK Day for an entire week. And if you are interested in volunteering, you can also do that on our website. And finally, the District 6 community meeting will be, our next meeting will be on January 17th at 6.30 p.m. at the Southeast Nashville Public Library in the large community room. We will continue our discussion on equity in education, and our guest speaker will be Mr. Ashford Hughes, Executive Officer for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, right here at Metro Nashville Public Schools. So I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, enjoy your time with family, and we will see you on the other side. Thank you. District 7. Um, where do I want to start? Okay. I, would, I want to re-echo my announcements from last time, my sentiment. We cannot have a symbiotic, we need to have a symbiotic relationship and not a parasite relationship with all Metro schools. Um, and I just want to kind of just make sure we iterate that, that needs to be a true partnership and not a one-way partnership. Um, no matter what type of school you are, when it comes to Metro um, Nashville schools and everyone else, that we have to work together and it's not just a one-way relationship. Um, uh, one thing I want to echo what um, Board Member Hayes about the Barry Manilow music. There's actually more MMPS <laughs> employees on there, but I won't let school board member Cheryl represent her district, but also for two or MMPS um, music um, teachers and employees. So go and vote. Um, I don't have a dog in this fight, but please vote for an MMPS employee that uh, the fact that I think there's eight, there's eight or 10 of them. McGavick. <laughs> and wouldn't okay. that be great? Let the, let the PR campaign begin for the wet, <laughs> wet cluster as the best music teacher. But I think it's a proud thing. I know I'm part of Music Make Us um, committee, and we are proud that over, like, out of the 10, um, eight of them are from Metro Public Schools. So go Metro Schools. Um, I also want to acknowledge Camille Bowell. She was elect she was selected in honor for 40 Under 40. Um, and so we like to acknowledge that that talent is right here within us. And so congratulations for that. Um, Um, also, um, I'd like to thank Leadership Nashville. I am lucky to be a member um, of this year's class, and we had a great education day. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Williams and Chief Henson for presenting and representing Metro Nashville very well and giving very thoughtful expertise um, information to the top leaders of Nashville. Um, also, I want to thank, um, even though know, Dr. Judge is not here, she did a great presentation, a very lively presentation that was very um, warmly accepted and warmly engaged and warmly appreciated by my fellow cohorts and classmates. And actually, their second favorite session um, of the day, um, well, for the third, um, but it was, it was one of the top three. We had natural, natural, the top three. Um, the other one was also our former board member, Jeannie Poo Poo Walker, and Dr. Battle had a lovely fireside chat, which they also got to see the greatness that we have within us. And the favorite part of my classmates were the two shining stars of our two school board members who spoke at lunchtime. As one of my classmates said, this was the best, that was the best panel and the best session of the entire day. And so they were going to get up some educational experts who do this for a living and they rock the house and that they made me proud. And made our board members there for the way, as we know from the sitting on this board with them, um, the way they were able to articulate um, with elegance and grace and with um, with great passion how they felt about Metro Schools, their experience with Metro Schools, and what they plan to do with their positions here on the board. So it's good to see their leadership bloom outside of this boardroom into the public to the best leaders in Nashville. So I thank you personally for what you did and just for that you're just growing into your leadership. And last but not least, um, I would love to congratulate that 
and due to my own name. The power player is our own Dr. Battle from Exios yeah. that she was named one of the top uh, one of the top 10 influential powerful people in Nashville. Of course we know that but we want to say congratulations that you get to share my name with the title. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with that, and we're just proud that you are one of our leaders in the hard work that you do, and that we're glad that the city really sees the influence and the hard work that you put in to making sure that you're doing probably the one most important jobs in the city about educating our children. And um, with that, and leading that effort. So, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy Festivus, Happy New Year, all that wonderful stuff, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> District Eight. Um, it's always really hard to follow Frida. Um, so can I change in order, maybe? <laughs> it might be just as hard to follow other people, too. Um, I, I um, had the opportunity over the past couple weeks to be in um, four schools in District 8 and saw a, in action advocacy centers and peace centers um, and just want to thank everyone on the MMPS team who has helped to get those up and running. The work that people are doing in those rooms with kids to help kids regulate, get back into class, be um, ready to learn, but also to help all the students who are in class trying to learn at the same time is pretty remarkable. Um, and uh, the educators I talked to were um, were very grateful for that. Um, and so I was particularly struck. There were lots of wonderful things happening in schools, but um, that was a, a thing that I hadn't seen live and in person before and just thought was fantastic. Um, and um, otherwise, just want to say happy holidays with all of the holidays that Frida just named for everyone. Um, and um, have a happy new year. District 9. Um, Hillwood also has an amazing art teacher, or well, he's the head of the arts department. He's the arts department chair. He is the orchestra leader. Um, Mr. Tyler Meredith is also up for the Barry Manilow Award. So um, all of our Hillwood parents, I ask you to find your way over to there, and I've shared, it's already on social media, um, I, Hillwood's shared it through their cluster families, um, Hillwood Athletics has shared it, I've shared it, so um, feel free to go to one of those spots and vote for Mr. Meredith. And then I also wanted to take a minute and congratulate um, some of our District 9 schools because they have earned a designation as one of the top 10 elementary and secondary schools um, for the amount of time they've spent reading in the month of November. And so I'm really proud that <coughs> District 9 had the top spot in both elementary and in secondary in Harpeth Valley Elementary and Bellevue Middle School. And um, Charlotte Park was also on there. I'm very excited to see that we had three schools. I'd love to see us continue to add more. Um, get those. There's plenty of time to read now that we're getting ready to have some break. I know I'm going to be reading a lot, so I encourage all of you to pick up a book and uh, let's log some of that time in and keep it up. All right, Dr. Nevin McKinney, you had a follow-up? Yeah, I just had a follow-up. I want to congratulate all of our December graduates um, that are graduating coming up this week, right? This week. Um, across our district. Oh, and so super congratulations to all of them and their hard work um, and wishing them all the best as they continue to, to, to advance um, and continue to build their futures. Thank you. I always want to put the Metro Council on notice to check the social media because you have been officially <laughs> challenged. <laughs> All right. Well, our junior board member, Ms. Mitchell, do you have any announcements? Um, I don't really have any announcements, but I hope that everyone has a great happy holidays and good luck to all the high schools out there with their exams. And, yeah. Your board member, Mr. Hale. Um. Same here. I just want to wish everybody good luck on their exams. Have a safe and resting holiday and come back to the new year and then coming school year with, you know, a lot more energy. That's it. Thank you so much to everybody that uh, participated. I know this time of year is very busy, so I appreciate my colleagues being here and, of course, our staff. Uh, just quick District 2 announcements. Uh, is also, I guess, an announcement about the entire school system. We have a really special program with the Vandy ISR program, and uh, which is the Interdisciplinary Science and Research Program at Vanderbilt University for our high school students. And um, several of them just won grants from the Tennessee Junior Academy of Sciences to complete their research process. 
projects, uh, Hillsborough High School, Stratford, and John Overton. So of course, that's why I'm bringing it up. Uh, were some of the students that received it. Uh, ben Watts, he is comparing the prevalence of something, Wabakat, something, in diverse ecosystems. Good job, Ben. You are, <laughs> you know things and can pronounce them, I bet. And uh, Nicholas Baroque, which is how caffeine uh, from different sources and dosages affect your developmental growth, which I actually participated in that study when I visited uh, Vanderbilt's ISR program about a year ago, and it was really very enlightening and interesting. So um, congratulations to those students and, of course, the other ISR students that are continuing to uh, do their different research projects and we're always interested in doing that and of course the students that apply for it. I appreciate my colleagues being here. We do have a meeting in January of course. That meeting is, um, uh, you guys have all the, uh, sorry I'm having a moment. You guys have all of the Outlook calendars for that. I believe it starts at 3.30, so I will double check that and of course get back to you. Remember, I'm trying to send emails the Friday before our meetings just to make sure that we are aware of our timelines and all of those things uh, so that we can have a quorum to our best ability. Looks like it starts at around 4 o'clock at this current time on the 10th. Outside of that, I appreciate everyone's um, participation inside of our retreat and having those fruitful conversations and of course our governance and other conversations that we had. Outside of that, I hope that you relax, you have a nice time, and I look forward to seeing you on the 10th. And thank you. Be there for further business. This meeting is adjourned. been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.